What does it mean to be liberal? There are a lot of people who hear that word and think politics, liberal versus conservative. But I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about liberalism. Do you know what it means? And do you know why it's important? More importantly, do you know how baked into it is the seed of its own demise, if you allow it? That's what I want to talk to you about today on The Reason We Learn. Hi, everybody. If this is your first time on my channel, welcome. I'm Deb Philman, mom, homeschooler, educator. This is a little bit outside the norm of my videos because I'm not going to talk about anything specifically to do with schools in this video or with teachers or education. I want to talk more about core values and what it means to be anti-racist versus opposed to racism or not racist or simply liberal, to have a liberal mindset, a liberal sensibility. I want to talk about this because I've gotten a lot of questions from people, parents, and just concerned viewers um, asking me to put it in some kind of layman's terms. What, 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 why is anti-racism bad? And are, it sounds good. I mean, why would you be opposed to that? And how do I even approach my child's school or anything to do with, with any of this without sounding like a racist? Well, I want to talk about that. And as I said, I want to because I want you to understand the difference between it and, and, and between anti-racism and liberalism. So first thing I want to read to you is a, a tweet from Bo Weingard. He says, I think it's wonderful that we care about creating and sustaining a racially tolerant society, but we should be very careful not to sacrifice other important values such as meritocracy, freedom of speech, rule of law, and proportionate punishment along the way. It is the fanatical obsession with one conception of justice that often leads to the suppression of rights and freedoms. It is not evil that motivates this, but a distorted sense of the good. So that's sort of a, a long way of saying it's great to be a liberal person, to want everyone's good, to want to be a tolerant society, to want to keep moving forward to the point where we really do take every individual as we find them, judge people on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. These are liberal values. There's just one problem. It doesn't work consistently. Part of why we have to keep working at it, we have to keep going with our liberalism and our mindset of, of working at it is that you will always have two things. You'll always have inequality of outcome. That's just the nature of life, okay? You will always have people who are of different abilities, different desires, different interests, um, who make different choices. Some make great choices. Some make poor choices. Some people have bad luck. I mean, there are a million different combinations that lead up to inequality of outcome. And sometimes that inequality of outcome can be quite extreme, okay? The other thing you're always going to have is you're always going to have people falling naturally into groups, classes. I mean, it's not even necessarily by choice, but sometimes it is, where you have individuals pursuing their individual happiness, and they end up in a given, you know, socioeconomic class. And then because they're in that socioeconomic class, they marry within that socioeconomic class, and they have children within that class, and so forth. And it's not that they're striving to have classes return to the country, or to be like old Europe or something where you have high and low and, you know, a caste system. It's not that. It's not that people are striving for that. It's that the liberalism itself and the ability to pursue that naturally will just lead to that. That's people will succeed and they will hang out more and more with people who succeed at similar levels. And you will end up with a cluster of people who are at one level and a cluster of people who are at a lower level. And it is only natural for human beings to strive to maintain what they've got. I mean, we all do it, right? To maintain or even increase what we've got. And in so doing, that can unintentionally create barriers for other people to get to the same place, um, especially when you bring into it a mindset that government should 
be brought in to sort of regulate the interactions between people, even well intent in well intentioned ways. But as soon as you put the government in charge of having anything to do with the economy, you can use it. People who are maybe less well intentioned can use it to maintain their place in the pecking order and their socioeconomic class, and that can create further barriers to competition and so forth. So that's one of the reasons I'm thoroughly opposed to the government being involved in the economy, as I think it makes it harder for us to be liberal. It makes it harder for us to really take individuals as they come and to talk about and sell things like meritocracy and freedom of association, because you will always find those people who can legitimately point to an example where somebody said, yeah, really, I tried to start a business and there were these 10 regulations and I couldn't afford it and I couldn't start my business. But of course, the deep pocket giant corporation could do it. So they see the enemy as the corporation. The corporation isn't really the enemy. The enemy is the government that sold influence to the corporation. The corporation is just do, doing what a corporation is going to do to survive like any other organism of business or or commerce or anything like that. If they were an individual human, they would do the same thing. If you were given the opportunity to get an advantage, you might take it. It doesn't make them inherently bad. It just is something that is offered to them. And government goes out of its way to almost sell these kinds of indulgences, if you will. So that's why I'm opposed to that. It does make it harder for us to sell liberalism makes it easier for Marxists to come in and say, see, capitalism failed, even though that's not capitalism. It's not capitalism when a Walmart goes to government and lobbies that there'll be all kinds of restrictions and regulations and rules and and licensing and all these things that make it harder and harder for small competitors to break into, into their marketplace or to dominate uh, you know, manufacturing and acquisition of goods so that you can't possibly get them at a competitive price. It makes it easier for Marxists to come in and say, see, you're getting a raw deal. They're in the upper 1% and you're away at the bottom, okay? So that's part of why I'm opposed to it. It it practically invites them in. And it's one of the flaws that we have in our system. You know, you're free to do that. You're free to lobby, freedom of speech. But because the government has its fingers in the economic pie, you're using your freedom of speech to lobby your government to do things that stratify society. So that's how it gets in the door. But one of the things I wanted to talk about and, and with regard to anti-racism is anti-racism is not selling Marxism. And I should, have, I should back up and say that that's basically what it is. It's, it's Marxism repackaged to sound not only helpful, but to sound like something you can't disagree with without impugning yourself, without sounding like you're not liberal, without sounding like you're opposed to this free and tolerant society without sounding like you're you're a white supremacist or a Nazi or something. So they've very cleverly reframed the same terminology that the Marxists used to use as race-oriented or identity-oriented. They've made it deeply personal. To say that there are classes and that one class oppresses the other class, um, if to refer to people as the bourgeoisie and the proletariat and things like that, that's very impersonal. It sounds very, it doesn't even sound 20th, 21st century. It sounds like some relic from a bygone era, if you even know those words, which most young people in particular don't. But when you say things like black and white or of color and white, and you talk about whites and people of color. And you talk about people's sexuality or gender identity or those kinds of immutable qualities. Now it's really personal. They have to look at themselves and say, where do I fit in? You don't say, you know, what class are you in? It's a little harder. It's a little fuzzier. Or are you the proletariat of the bourgeoisie? I don't know. Okay. It's it's a little less personal. Now it's really personal. Now if somebody says, well, I'm opposed to anti-racism, it's easier to say you're opposed to those people because they fit into the of color group or they fit into the non cisgendered you know heteronormative qual- whatever category whatever whatever it is it's now attached to people's personal identities very clever very clever but i watched a video that does a much better job of explaining all this and i want to um show you parts of it because i really think that it explains things far better than i ever could So this is Andrew Doyle, and he is debunking anti-racism. And I saw this clip the other day, and I thought, this does a much better job of explaining it succinctly than I ever could. So I'm going to pull some of the clip into this video, and um, please give it a listen. Uh, 
it's such a dangerous divisive backward philosophy of life it's the, it's the idea that you divide us into oppressed and oppressor irrespective of our personal circumstances and you 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 know it, it's racist in every way it is possible to be racist it, it, you know it degrades people of color by telling them that they're always going to be victims that they never they will never uh, achieve anything that they deserve to achieve and it's racist against white people because it tells them that they are uh, oppressive and racist and in particular robert d'angelo who will claim that if you deny your complicity in white supremacy that just proves you're a white supremacist right so this it's it's absolutely appalling and abysmal. And of course, because she used the phrase, and, and uh, well, people of that ilk use the phrase anti-racism to describe what they're doing. If you complain about anti-racism or make the case that anti-racism is a bad thing, it sounds like you're saying that you are for racism. <laughs> and of course, the reason for opposing anti-racism is if you are concerned about actual racism. That's the problem. So this gets very complicated. There's this whole lexicon you sort of have to, you have to master before you can get anywhere. It also makes people rightly nervous. They understand that, you know. Most people are, are concerned about uh, the anti-racism in terms of unconscious bias training, implicit bias training, dividing people up. I mean, Sainsbury's literally created an online safe space for their black employees. I mean, how patronizing is that? Um, so people are nervous about this. But they don't want to be seen to be opposed to anti-racism. It's a very clever phrase that they use. But what people have to understand is that anti-racism is a rehabilitated form of racialized thinking. In other words, it is a form of racism. And if you really care about combating racism, as I do, then you will oppose anti-racism. And you'll go back to the liberal approach, uh, the liberal approach to combating racism. And the reason why that's a good thing is we've got the past six decades of progress which prove that it works. And sure, it hasn't achieved a complete utopia where racism doesn't exist that will never happen because we live in a society of human beings and there's always going to be some nasty pieces of work amongst us right but the best the absolute best way as has been proven by recent history is the liberal approach is that you would tackle racism rigorously whenever it occurs what you don't do is create this faith-based philosophy where there are nebulous power structures that only people like robin d'angelo are qualified to detect and therefore you implement policy on that basis in the government in the arts in education in the media absolutely everywhere and then you're solving problems that may or may not exist on the basis of this this deity that you've created. That's not the way to go about this. And we know this is the case. So people who do believe in those liberal values, those decent values of equality and fairness and, and looking out for people and ensuring that people aren't uh, mistreated in society and discriminated against, those are the people who need to advance the liberal uh, agenda, the social liberalism that has served us so well for so long uh, that is now being utterly demolished before our eyes. And there you have it. That is exactly, I think, what Bo is, is talking about or alluding to here is that we we care so much that we sort of run the risk of caring too much. And I think it has brought about or it has opened the door to this neo-Marxist idea called anti-racism. And make no mistake, it is Marxist. And we've allowed it in the door because we have failed to teach our children gratitude for the liberalism that we have, gratitude for the progress we have made. Uh, we have failed to teach them about the flawed humans who still, though, you know, despite their flaws, uh, fought for liberty. People like Abraham Lincoln, who, you know, far from perfect, still gave his life so that slaves might be freed because he did. He was assassinated for that policy. And we now have at least two generations of people in America who have no sense of perspective about the past to know about the 60 years, as he said, the six decades of progress that liberalism has made. So they only know how to be impatient for things to be perfect. They don't understand that perfection doesn't exist. They don't understand what things are like in other countries. They don't really understand the hard work it took to get here. They have no respect for the many, many people who came before them who really did suffer and really were oppressed. They think they are and they're not. Um, and in short, we have accidentally uh, given rise to our own future oppressors in our zeal to fight oppression. And I, I know that sounds contradictory, but that's really the gist of it. So we need to really take stock in what we have. We need to value what we have. We need to um, stop apologizing for things like, you know, inequality of outcome and take more pride in equality of opportunity. 
We need to point out the difference. We need to teach our kids about the difference. And we need to stop acting like there is a difference between, you know, liberalism and, uh, you know, Americanism, if you will, like as if they're, they're mutually exclusive. No, they're the same thing. And I hate the fact that people associate the word liberal with politics because it's not. That's not the kind of liberalism I'm talking about. America was founded on liberal principles. We are all, if we believe in American exceptionalism, we're all liberals. Even those amongst us who call themselves conservatives are liberals. And it's long past time that we embrace that because people right now who claim to represent those values represent the opposite. And we're all going to accidentally march right into their little gulags of thought first and possibly literally later if we don't push back and embrace our own liberalism and defend it with all we've got. So I hope I've helped you understand a little bit better about anti-racism, how uh, it really is versus liberalism. And liberalism is not racism, okay? And um, if you have further comments or questions, please put them in the comments. I hope this content was valuable to you. If it was, please subscribe to the channel, share this video, comment on this video, like this video, and that's the video.